Hey guys, we'll be talking about lols, low-level shells. Any anyone has an idea why it's called lol? You'll find out. So I'm Lise. This is Manish. So we work for SecureNet. I'm a penetration tester. Manish is a security consultant. And for this project, I am a independent researcher. But uh, my company helped me uh, bring this forward to you guys. So what's the story? Basically, the story is that uh, I was trying to get a netcat shell, and uh, my colleague at the time gave me like a switch. I was unaware that the switch was a layer th three switch, and I'm like, well, you need an IP, right? Right? Well, that's an only an assumption. The hypothesis is that layer two can be used for a netcat shell, but this would need to be post-compromise. So how exactly is that going to work? Well, we made this meme for you to kind of explain it. I'll give a couple seconds. So the thought process. Um, we'll need a MAC address, and uh, all layer three traffic is encapsulated in frames, which means that um, uh, you will need an IP. But uh, what tools already exist that kind of accommodate this? And uh, there's a tool by the name of ARP, ARP Exfiltrator that was made by Antonio Blasia. And uh, he was able to exfiltrate ARP requests uh, back and forth between uh, two nodes. And uh, he suspected that this is able to, this was p to, uh, could be used in a, in a C2 framework. So in other words, it's possible, but with ARP. So when life gives you layer two, make a layer two shell. Bottom line, it's possible to encode information in frames, but not through encapsulation. So why is this such a big deal? Well, the big deal is that layer three and above is highly monitored. Layer two is not which means that communications don't actually need IP or port to work. So how does layer two work? Well, we have 802.3, 802.11, which is wireless, and uh, they work on the same frames, or in, in same frames, same headers, and um, all, all our payloads, all our stuff is gonna be sh stored in the, in the payload header of a frame. Um, our broadcast to all, pro uh, to all to all nodes on the network using the FFFF uh, address. Um, but other protocols can do the exact same thing. There's no difference. Uh, the ether type is what defines the, a protocol. And in IANA, you can register your own ether type, which we'll get into the next section. Ether types, why are they so important? During DEF CON 31, Richard Lache, he did a talk about this in his uh, talk, Fantastic World of Ether Types and Where to Find Them. Uh, his talk was more about how to use ether types and how to structure them to uh, communicate with devices. In our prototype, we will not be using ether types specifically. We'll be using them to blend them in to uh, make it more covert. So here's the payload. Uh, we have 1,500 bytes that we can work with. So broadcast uh, domain communication. So as we all know, uh, whenever layer uh, we get a broadcast message sent on a layer two, it gets sent out to all the devices that are connected to that switch. So why is this important? Uh, we, we, are, we were trying to see if we could include netcat, PowerShell, SSH commands in these broadcast domain messages, which could be sent out to the other systems that are on the, uh, on the broadcast domain. So, uh, Let's see what are the requirements and what the data flow looks like for doing this. So the requirement, as Alicia spoke, this is a post-compromise tool, so we, we are going to need initial compromise. Uh, in addition to that, we need Python and C-sharp to be available on the compromise system. Uh, binary, if you are using anything, uh, for example, Netcat, if you're using that, uh, we will need that and a loader of some sort. Uh, so this is, in a nutshell, what is happening. The victim is uh, send, uh, sending commands via Ethernet frames, and the victim is responding with Ethernet frames back with uh, the response. So let's take a look, a uh, detailed look at the flow. So yeah, the attacker starts off by sending Ethernet frames containing the command. The victim node then uh, decodes the frames, ex extracts the command, and executes it. Once the command is executed, the victim node then again uses Ethernet frames to send, uh, send the information back to the attacker node. So let's take a look at a demo quickly uh, for this. Uh, before I jump into the demo, I want to show the commands that we are running. On the victim node, we are running the script in listen mode and setting the attacker and session ID. 
And on the attacker system, we are running it in connect mode, again, setting the same at, uh, attacker and session ID. Additionally, we are providing the MAC address of the victim machine. Uh, and then we'll be running whoam and dir command. Uh, as uh, Elise spoke earlier about ether types, uh, for the second uh, section of it, we'll be using STP as the ethernet type. Uh, the code for that is 8181. Let me pull the video. So yeah, uh, on the right hand side, we have the victim screen using Windows, which is connected uh, in listen mode, and then we are using uh, the Debian machine on the left, uh, on the right, uh, to connect to the victim, we are running who am I and your command. And uh, we have Wireshark running in the background to capture the packets. So as we can see, uh, the commands that were sent were using loopback, and the responses that were received were using broadcast messages. So now we'll take a look at the ether type that we spoke about. So the only difference between the two commands is we are specifying the ether type this time around. Uh, to see what sort of communication uh, it, it happens. So the ether type, we are using it to blend in. So again, we'll run the same commands, who am I, enter. Yeah. So let's take a look at the Wireshark capture. We'll pro, uh, do the filter for 8181. So as you can see, the commands were sent using STP this time around. So, yeah. Okay. So, is broadcast communication required? Absolutely not. We could use point to point communication as well. The reason why we chose broadcast for this particular example because uh, broadcast communication is usually noisier and it gets some time lost. Uh, and, like, sometimes the security tools ignore those. So to kind of prove the point that communication not only can, like, we can tunnel uh, layer three and above, uh, we're going to be tunneling Netcat in the next uh, demo, which the prototype does uh, support. Uh, this is the kind of diagram of what's happening. I'm not going to go through it, but uh, basically we do the exact same thing. The attacker sends the Ethernet frame. The victim receives it. It then decodes it. It sends it to its own loopback address where Netcat is listening. Netcat can then run uh, that command. The response is sent to its own loopback address and then out to the uh, out through ether, uh, Ethernet. The exact same opposite happens um, uh, when the victim is uh, is listening, and this enables uh, two-way communication uh, back and forth. But uh, this not only works on Netcat; this works on uh, anything. So here we have the attacker panel. Uh, the thing that's highlighted that's where you type in commands for Netcat. I'll give everyone a couple seconds. Uh, the victim panel here, what's highlighted is the actual uh, netcat command. Uh, on the right side of the screen, that's the, that's the tool that's being uh, for uh, L2 shell. OK, we're going to make EDR cry now. Okay, so on the right side, or sorry, left side, that's where the uh, L2 shell is. We're opening up a RDP port or uh, an RDP uh, session to the victim machine. Now, the reason why we're, oh, sorry, the reason why we're doing this now is is to show that uh, we have the initial compromise. And okay, that. Sorry about this. We're having some technical issues. Okay, so we have an EDR solution uh, that's on the victim machine, and the threat detected, that's only Netcat, that's not L2 shell. Once an administrator um, manually locks this up, uh, it will actually cut the RDP session. Uh, what, basically, nothing will be able to communicate to that device uh, on any known protocol. So that's what happened here. However, we have here the L2 shell that was uh, initialized earlier, we can still communicate to it via Ethernet. Okay. I'll just close that. This is essentially what happened. Uh, frames, they do not uh, get 
get detected and they are uh, EDR IDS, they allow it to pass through. Uh, this is all the, the loopback traffic that happens on the host and the victim. Uh, it never, it never uh, appears out of the network. So uh, what are the limitations of this? Well, obviously we got the broadcast domain and the frame headers, they're cut off by the, by the routers once they traverse to different networks, but uh, we can bypass this with a NIC. We can do VLAN hopping, directed broadcasts from routers, layer three, four, application layer protocols, uh, out-of-band bridges. Uh, these are all ways we can extend from one LAN to another. Uh, MPLS networks, uh, this, uh, this works on MPLS the same way that it works on any other uh, ether type. Uh, MPLS circuits can enable that communication. Uh, internal ICS networks are very flat. It, uh, it allows, um, this it would be a prime target for this. So uh, we could also do layer two forwarding. So uh, if there is a victim machine that is compromised, we could jump from one NIC to the other one, uh, basically hopping the subnet. Uh, we could also create temporary layer three, layer four bridges with this, uh, basically accessing restricted subnets that could, uh, that could have like data, uh, data, uh, DLP preventions on them. So uh, the use case that we can think of is a red teaming scenario where, uh, or like a C2 extension basically where uh, we are using this for communication between the compromised host. So out of the six uh, hosts that are here, we are using, uh, three of them are not using the L2 shell. So they are at risk of getting compromised. However, the ones that are using L2 shell, they would be very hard to detect. So now this is kind of the grim part of the, uh, of the presentation, uh, detections. Uh, unfortunately, we will need layer two sensors. We'll need to span tap the, the traffic. Uh, this might work on 802.11. It works on 802.3, so just regular ethernet. Uh, the entropy and size of packets, they're gonna have to be looked at. Uh, the expected ether types, for example, if you have the configuration test protocol on your network, it probably should not be there in the first place. Uh, the only way to really know this is to baseline things. Signatures, uh, good luck, have fun, it might work. Uh, however, this is only to detect common commands if they're unencrypted. Um, Zeek might, if it, it, out of the box, Zeek is not going to detect it and it's kind of expensive to, to utilize. Um, another detection is to inspect the loopback traffic if, the te if our technique is used. It's an adjacent issue, but it's good when paired with covert communication. Um, it's not just a network or endpoint problem anymore. So take a picture of this. Uh, this is gonna be how you detect anomalous traffic via ethernet. Um, now, if the traffic is not anomalous, it's a lot harder to detect. So, so here's the, the good, the bad, and the ugly for detections. Uh, if it's IPv4, uh, ARP, or IPv6 ether type, it's significantly harder to detect. So the highlighted uh, green, that's all the detections with anomalies. The above is basically uh, IPv6. You can't really tell the difference. So defenses, VLANs, that kind of depends if you're only working on one NIC. Uh, isolated guest networks, I couldn't break, break through it through that one, so it might be good. Uh, there's certain limitations to it. And cloud environments, it depends how layer two traffic is, uh, is implemented on them. What has been in the wild? Um, there has been an APT group, Platinum, that utilized SOL in their C2 framework. However, when I looked closer into it, it seemed to use IP. Uh, IP is not used in this prototype, so it's similar but not quite the same. So closing remarks, uh, this is not a vulnerability. Uh, this is basically frames without structure are still frames. Um, layer two detections only work for known attacks. DPI, unless otherwise configured, isn't really looking for this. Uh, wireless devices can communicate on Ethernet device to other Ethernet devices. Um, works in line, so it's system network agnostic as long as 802.3, 802.11 are supported. Um, and has this research been performed? Uh, I referenced all the people that have done similar research. I haven't really found anything quite to this extent. Uh, however, there is a references page that will show everyone who uh, did similar. Um, TLDR, it's command control focus, uh, ethernet transport agnostic. 
Uh, there's ether type uh, smuggling. Um, this evades all most layer three to seven IDS without disrupting other network hosts. And uh, how does everyone feel about supply chains? Because uh, that could be a problematic if this, this is used as a technique. Million frame question, are adversaries using this? I don't know. But uh, now that the ether cat's out of the bag, what's next? Should vendors do more or is this a free for all? So here are the references. And uh, big thank you to B-Sides Las Vegas and the security community. Special thank you to Steve Porter, Doug Lease, and Quinn Kramer for helping me and the team make this happen. Questions? Any questions? Sorry, which slide? Can you, can you come up to the microphone, please? Sorry. Yeah, the command to detect the traffic, the TCP detect dump. The oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, this is it. This is only going to detect anomalous traffic. This, this won't detect uh, frames that are uh, properly structured and, and basically that are made by uh, not amateurs. I don't know. So I'm understanding this correct. Like I said, this has to be on the broadcast domain. The two, the two device, your, your victim and your aggressor have to be on the same uh, broadcast domain, right? Not necessarily. It depends. Uh, they can be on different networks, but the actual communication it, it happens on LAN. But if if for example there's like multi NIC, so you can jump from one network to oh, the other. Okay. This wouldn't work like if it had to go through a switch because it would, like you said, it would strip the uh, folder. Well, I guess I'm, what I'm getting at is um, the value in this is it would require uh, your your um, your aggressor. You would have to have some sort of you know, if you wanted to use this as a remote attack, you would have to have some sort of so, channel to get to it. So this is post compromise. So the consideration here is you already have compromised the victim machine. You are already on the same network as them. So it could be something that you use for pivoting for covert communication. Uh, so it's basically sort of, uh, you could think of it as a C2 extension, basically. So okay. but, but both, both of them would need to be compromised, the victim and the aggressor. So uh, initially, once you have compromised, you would be on the same network, right? So okay, from there, you, you, could, you could move on to a different target who is in a different network. Uh -huh. And then you still have to be able to bypass the EDR to... Uh, yes, if, if that is the case. But uh, the thing is, layer two isn't monitored that... No, no, much. layer so, two isn't, but in order to get the initial compromise. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So that, that's, that's the only consideration here, initial compromise. So yeah, this is, uh, is post-compromise, uh, and it's for, mostly for covert communication. So actually, now that I'm thinking about this a little bit, where this might be a value, is like if you're doing a, a pen test engagement where you actually get physical access to the facility and you somehow put a, a malicious device. Yeah. That yeah. connects directly to the network, but yes. then you have yes. access via some other. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. No, not that this count what you guys done. This is really cool. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Just checking my understanding. Do you need uh, raw sockets for this to work or not? I'm sorry. Do you need raw sockets to do this or not? Uh, you. So you need admin privileges. So this requires sudo. But uh, it does it like raw sockets. It would work on IP, right? But this would be pure frames. So, in a way, yes. Okay. Uh, have you considered doing this same type of payload, but using um, setting the protocol to be IP, but just have invalid payload inside the IP packet? I'm, I'm, I didn't quite understand that. Sorry. You, if you're if you're making raw frames, have you considered? Um, Having an IP, having something that is labeled as being an IP packet, but just with random content. So we are not really using IP. So it's either broadcast or Mac to Mac. OK. Yeah. Hey, are you going to be open sourcing any of the code you showed off today? We're considering releasing this. We, we don't really know. Uh, 
the impact of this right now, but uh, we're, we're considering it. Uh, raise a hands. Who would like this release so they can look at this? We need a lot more hands than that. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Come on, put up.